And welcome into another episode of In Depth with Fox Carolina Sports. Hey there, I'm Aaron Cheslock, and as we do each week, we bring you local coaches and athletes and walk their path to where they're at right now in their careers. And uh, boy, what a resume we have for our guest this week, head coach of the Presbyterian Blue Hose, Kevin Kelly. Uh, coach, uh, so much I want to go over with you, but you've been on the job for just over a month now. Uh, how's it going? Is it what you imagined? Have there been any speed bumps? What, what can you update us on? Uh, it's a little bit of a tornado and has been for a couple of weeks, but a good tornado. You know, I, I was at a great place. And I think I'm getting to come to a great place. Uh, so besides trying to talk to the current team here and get into the recruiting world and talk to some of the coaches in the state, I think it's important to develop that relationship. Then I get to talk to guys like you and hopefully spread the, spread the light of how great a place this is. You've, uh, you know, when you look at, we're going to go over your career in, uh, in depth, pardon the pun, in just a little bit, but, you know, you helped build one of the most successful high school programs in the country. And after almost two decades, you decide to take a college job. So why now? Why Presbyterian? You know, for a couple of reasons, really. And uh, one, I've always thought about getting in the college game for, for a long time and had some chances as a position coach. I actually interviewed for a few head jobs. And I would get in there and, and, and I would ask the athletic director, you know, at, at what point when we're on the field and we're doing the punting, not punting when people traditionally do or onside kicking or things like that, you know, how's that going to affect you? And they're like, they're usually like, well, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope you kind of curb some of that. And I'm thinking, why are you talking to me? Because I feel like that's been a small part of what's helped, helped uh, you know, be as successful as it has been. So that was part of it. Part of it was I had one of my assistant coaches that's been with me the entire 18 years that I was the head coach at Pulaski Academy took me in one day and he goes what are we going to do you know to to keep getting a challenge said, what do you mean he said you know there's always a challenge of wanting to improve the team and this and that and and when we spread out the first state championships we've won six of the last seven so really we've got nowhere to go but down and I started thinking about that and I'm like okay I don't want to be part of something that's going down not that it would but I mean it's tough and uh, that combined with a great opportunity and great people here and uh, a chance to for the challenge of, you know, showing people that I believe in this at the college level and all levels of football. It was very enticing, and then mix it with the people I got to meet with. And the AD here, Rob Acunto, said, hey, you do what you want to do on the field. And that was very enticing to me as well. Now, you know, football coaches are creatures of habit. You guys all are kind of type A personalities. You got to just plunge forward, you rarely look back, right? But uh, from what I could gather, you spent the majority of your life, if not all your life, in Arkansas. Correct me if I'm wrong. So I, I got to imagine that, you know, uh, you know, I, I saw you're a father of two kids. You know, that's got to be tough to decide, okay, now's the time that we're going to leave the state that, you know, we've been in our entire lives. How did it go over with the family and that whole dynamic? Uh, you know, to go a little bit further back than that, the first 14 years of my life, I don't think I left the state. Finally got to go visit the ocean when I was 14, I think one time, and then again when I was 18. And so, yeah, I've been in Arkansas a long time. But then I did, when I graduated college, I went and coached down in Texas. And I was in the Dallas area for four or five years. And uh, so that, that kind of prepared me a little bit because talk about culture shock. I went from a town of 1,400 to a town of a metropolitan area of maybe six, seven million. And uh, that got me a little bit ready for, you know, moving around. I moved back to Little Rock, which was a big town for me, even coming out of that 14, uh, 1,400-person town in Glenwood. And, uh, you know, I loved it, and there's a lot of things I love about Arkansas. I love developing a name for myself, you know, uh, and, and coming from not much, really. And uh, But did that through doing things right and success. And, and, again, maybe it's a chance to do that on the college level, but that's not the goal. The goal is to get here and uh, take some of the lessons – in life that you teach football players in high school but I think you can do that in college too I think there's tons of lessons and one of those is that there's a different way to approach things and I think you can approach football differently and if you can do that I think the kids leaving here with so much others that the other things that they get from Presbyterian College they'll I'm hoping our players leave with a different a different attitude towards things that hey you don't always have to do the same way do things the same way everybody else is there's a different way to attack things and you can still be successful. Now, what Coach Kelly's referring to here is the a more, uh, I, I guess I would say, new age analytic style that you uh, go into a football game with, which includes uh, rarely punting uh, on fourth down and almost always going for onside kicks. Now, I, I've talked to you before, and I know about the percentages. I've done some research uh, since then. But I'm curious, your rationale uh, on why do you 
play this game the way that you do versus the 99% of the rest of the college coaches and high school coaches that are pretty uh, cut from the same cloth. Uh, what's the rationale behind it? If you could just put in the simplest terms for folks that are watching this uh, that aren't familiar with your backstory. Uh, the rationale, I guess, is in the game of football, because it's a contact physical sport, most of the time the biggest, fastest teams will win if everybody plays the same way. And when I got to the school I was at, they had never been past the Final Four uh, ever in the history of the school and only been there a couple of times. And I just thought they didn't hire me to come and do that. They wanted somebody to go another level, as they say, you know, maybe to win a championship. And to be able to do that, we had to play the game differently because our kids weren't the biggest, fastest kids. They had never won before that, and I thought they had some pretty good coaches. So that said, I just wanted to do what I could do for the team to win. So I started asking the question, why? And when I got to off the field, that was easy. Why are we preparing this way? Why are we eating this pregame meal? Why are we working in March on the weights we're doing? But on the field, I simply asked, why are we punting? You know, why are we doing our offense the way we're doing? Those kinds of things. If I couldn't answer the question with something that made sense, but it was always, well, that's what everybody does. But I didn't really know why everybody did it. I started looking into it and researching it. And, and then slowly but surely, I started doing that in 03 before Moneyball came out. And that was well before analytics. And then Moneyball, I think the book came out later at the end of that year. Then in 05, the movie may have came, come out. Then analytics became a thing I could really dive into and base some of what we were doing on. I mean, you know, that makes up in the world of football, that makes up about that much. But that much can be the difference between winning a lot of games and losing a lot of games. So, I mean, football's to football. You've still got to be able to block and tackle and catch. I do teach the game a little differently where we don't necessarily have to be able to tackle the same physical style as everybody else. We don't have to go try to run over guys. I would just assume a guy, even in, even in the layman part of football, I would just assume a guy, if he's running down the sideline, he's got a chance to hit a guy and make an extra yard or run out of bounds and not get hit at all. I'd rather him go out of bounds and not get hit at all. So he feels healthier the next play, the next week. I think you get more out of him that way. So all those things considered, we do play the game a lot differently, but it was out of necessity because I don't ever want to be, you know, if I'm in Alabama, maybe I do play the game that way because Nick Saban can do that. His guys are bigger and faster. He's still got a coach and he does a marvelous job. Don't get me wrong. Everybody knows that. But we don't have those guys here. I didn't have those guys where I was, and I still want a chance to be the best and win a championship, and I just think you can do it if you play the game differently. So let, let's back up the points that Coach was just making there, and I'm going to brag on you a little bit because it has led to some pretty incredible success during your time at Pulaski, High in, uh, or Pulaski Academy, I should say, in Arkansas. Uh, 24 seasons, the last 18 you were there as head coach nine state championships, more than 200 wins in his 18 years as head coach. His players and teams broke 15 national high school football records. Uh, he was 2016 USC, USA Today uh, National Coach of the Year. And of course, that's led you here to the upstate, the 16th head coach in Presbyterian. When you think back to your time in Arkansas, Obviously, you didn't take over as head coach and then immediately everything came together. Uh, what was the turning point? What stands out the most out of all those accomplishments? The, there was a turning point. The turning point was game one. My very first game as head coach, I remember it so clearly. We were playing Gus Malzahn. I think it was his last year maybe oh, or boy. at, at, at uh, Springdale High, and they had, they had some really good players. And, you know, I, I thought I had it set and thought I, you know, I'd already dabbled in the offseason, the idea of not punting and those kinds of things. And he beat me 63 to nothing. And I remember at halftime, I think they went and kicked a field goal to make it like 38 to nothing at halftime. Uh, and I walked off the field and my wife and one of my friends in the front row, and I looked at them and I said, this is like the fifth worst day of my life behind some people dying, you know, some close family members. And I just thought, my goodness, I'm in over my head. I mean, you know, you just have all these terrible thoughts. It's your first day, really. And so that week, I just started tearing the thing apart again and going, what can we change now to win now? And uh, I moved some people around, changed some things up. I mean, so many things inside the program that first week, which could have been another disaster because the funny part was that was Springdale were the defending biggest classification champs. 
the next week we played the next highest classification champs, and the next week we played the next highest after that classification state champs. So we had three state champions in a row, and I knew we were going to do something. I was going to be run out of a job early. So then I started uh, – that, that was a light bulb moment for me, so to speak. I am proud to say that we won the next two games, lost the next one when ran the table, and uh, won the state championship in that first year after we changed some of those things up. And that really got me on track and got me some confidence that you could – you can have a disaster and still come back, some come back from that. And, and I think it taught our kids a lot, our coaching staff a lot. But that was the moment, honestly, when I thought, you better, you better have a good reason for everything you're doing because people start to question immediately. I mean, you could be 63 to nothing. Everybody's looking at me going, you know, we weren't as into this style as we are now. But they're going, they're questioning. And you've got to be able to say, here's why we do it. Not, you know, you can't throw it out because of one game. That's not a big sample size. Luckily, we got things on track and uh, gave me a lot of confidence going forward to try more things, which we ended up doing 06, 07, and even now doing things a lot differently um, because with that confidence, you can try new things. I, I, I did not know that. That's uh, pretty incredible. So it was 5A, 4A, 3A? Yeah, that's what State it was that champs, time, yeah. Your first yeah. three games. First three games, yeah. And it was a tough schedule. week one to week two, you tear the whole thing up, and that's unbelievable. I mean, I don't know how often that's ever happened in the game of football, to be honest with you. No, it was. Yeah, it's an interesting story. We've I've got a couple of people that are talking to me that have talked to me in the past, and they're talking to me right now about making a movie. And uh, I would say they've got to include that. That week one was something. That, I mean, I started not to go back to school. I was like, do we have a job? Can I find some other way to make money for my family? You know, that that's where I was. It was so crazy. And then uh, – Thank goodness that that next week, because we had, we played that the the next highest club four A team Stuttgart. I'll never forget it, and we went into that with a bunch of changes, thinking if this doesn't work, I don't know where this ends up. You know, I don't make it through the year possibly. You know how the game of football is. You've got to win, and if you get killed twice in a row your first two games, you may not make it to week three. So uh, I'm very glad that that happened. But I'm now because it taught me a ton. So you look at the. Uh philosophy that you're known for now you had six years as offensive coordinator before you take over as head coach were you dabbling at that point or were you pushing the envelope like to, to the guy running the program at the time that this is what we should be doing and you know it was just deaf ears at that point how, how did that develop I didn't have a reason but I all I, I say that I didn't have a reason on the field not an analytical reason to push for going for it on fourth down. But I always was really good. I, I think one of the things I'm good at in life, God didn't make me good at much. He made me good at, at, at some things on the field, some X's and O's and some teaching. And I think that um, we were pretty good on offense. We were really good, as a matter of fact, because I think in 2001 we set a national record for passing yards in a season for all the 17,000 high schools that play, play football. And, uh, and we set a record for touchdowns and all that kind of stuff. At the same time, I thought we're pretty good on offense, so I was pushing him to let me use fourth down. Like, we're so good. God, give me one more down. How good could we be? And I was pushing for that, but nothing analytically based. And, you know, he didn't really – you know, he was an old-school coach. So that was – it was a big thing to let me open it up and throw the ball back then. So he wasn't really on board for that. And I'd always thought, if I ever do get a coaching job – and I didn't think it would be there as a head coach. I always thought, if I ever do get a head coaching job – then if you're trying to get this guy to do it when his name's on the line, you've got to do it when your name's on the line. And that was, that was the, kind of the first times I really thought of that. When you look at uh, how you're known now nationally, I mean, most of us certainly, uh, me included, it, you, we know you as this great successful high school coach who's done all these great things, the resume that I just went over. But I gotta imagine when you're first starting to kick the tires on this thing, there's a lot of backlash from football puri purists out there. What are some of the things that, you know, you heard that uh, maybe shook your confidence a little bit? Uh, you know, that's funny. That's the second time I've been asked that today. Um, I was on the Jim Rome show earlier, and he asked that. And, 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 and what I told him was it was funny. The very first year I was the head coach and it started happening, I walked into a coach's meeting at the end of the season, and I was like the guy with the disease. I mean, like we sat down and we had, uh, you know, they, they'll serve pizza or something that these coaches love to eat. And they'll serve a meal. And I sat down at the table and everybody moved away from me. And I'm like, what's going on? And it was like, you're, you're ruining our game. You're kind of making a mockery of our game. And I'm like, 
just trying to figure out a way to win, guys. I mean, you know, I mean, that's what everybody's trying to do. Like, we, we, they didn't like it. It was the purest. It was the old school coaches. And uh, that was tough, you know, because you're happy walking in at the end of the season. I felt like we had turned it around. We weren't to the playoffs yet because you have it right at the end of the regular season. And I'm like, golly, I thought it would be a good thing, a nice thing. I was kind of proud of what we had done. And uh, that told me a lot, too. That, But, but luckily – I don't know, thick skin's the word. I'm kind of risk averse. Like, I don't think of the bad things that could happen. I think of what good could happen. And I'm like, you know what? That really taught me this. I think a football coach's job, and really anybody's job, but a football coach's job is to make the decisions that he thinks gives his team the best chance for success. All the fans that are buying tickets, all the kids that are out there working so hard all year round to get ready, we shouldn't not make a decision because we're worried about the crowd booing us or the media getting on us if, we, if it doesn't turn out well. If we believe that's the best thing to do, then we should do that. And uh, I would say that because of media, social media, crowds, and the pressure with the job and maybe even worried about losing their job if they go for it on fourth down in the first quarter and don't make it and lose the game. Maybe they don't make it through Monday. Because of all those factors, I don't think that coaches always do what they think is the best. I think they think I, they always do what everybody else will do in some of those situations to get them through and to get them through to the next week. Now, i got to ask you on the flip side of that, did you have one of those naysayers come back up to you years down the line and say, you know what, I doubted you at first, but – Boy, you're proving a lot of people wrong right now. You know, I have had a handful of people that, that have come to me and said, yeah, I never would have believed in this. My favorite aren't those people. My favorite are the ones that say, I love watching this kind of football now. I can't even hardly watch it on Saturdays and Sundays anymore. That's the kind that kind of makes me light up because I like introducing new things to new people. And uh, so that's probably my favorite thing. You're uh, coming to a Presbyterian program that's non-scholarship FCS, now in the Pioneer League. Uh, so as far as your first college job, this is one with, uh, you know, in theory, a lot of speed bumps ahead of you. What, how do you approach that? How much of a challenge do you see it? You know, in that realm, it's perfect because let's hypothetically say I had Tackett taken over at Clemson. You know, Dabo Sweeney, and for some reason they hire this crazy guy that comes in there and does things. You know, if we, if I, if we win playing a different brand of football at Clemson after they've been winning, everybody's like, well, anybody could win then at Clemson, right? But if, if we come here where they haven't been as successful and we win here, then nobody will say that it's not helpful with this brand of football. It won't be because they've been lining up and dominating people for years anyway. So the non-scholarship thing, you know, if we can somehow win the conference, and that's a big enough challenge because they haven't done that here in a long time, and we make the playoffs and we're playing scholarship teams and we perform well and this brand helps in that, nobody can ever doubt that this played a big part in, in, that, in that kind of football and winning and, and that kind of thing. So this may, that makes this situation the perfect situation. Uh, your resume is impressive, as I mentioned, but the recommendations you're getting from some of the top players, uh, that some of the top players in the NFL, some of the top coaches in the NFL, Hunter Henry, a guy that played for you, uh, came onto your press conference, and then we were all kind of blown away by Bill Belichick, arguably uh, the best head coach in National Football League now and arguably the best in history. Uh, when you look at your style and all that ridicule that you went through that you re referenced there a second ago, and then you have Bill Belichick asking for pointers on how he can improve uh, the way he does things, that's got to be the biggest uh, badge of honor you can get as a football coach. You know, the badge of honor was more because I do, I believe Bill's the greatest possible coach that's ever coached any sport. I mean, there are some great ones out there. And, and uh, when he and I get to collaborate and he, you know, wanted to talk to me, that just gave me confidence, more confidence to try new things. And then getting to talk to him and, and I r quickly got to see why he's the best coach in the game of football that's ever lived because he thought, he's showing me things that are routine to him that I never would have even thought of as a thing in football. And uh, so a guy like that, that's going to give you confidence and made me really even want to dive more into some things that I was doing and uh, expand it to different parts of the program. But it also brought me, it also taught me 
to throw some of the littler parts out that I was doing and focus on the big things that matter the most in the game of football. Well, there's analytics for everything now, and then there's you surround yourself with good people, and if you can get people to buy in, then you've got a chance to really do something special like he's done and, and hopefully like I've done at the high school level and have a chance to do that at Presbyterian. Now, you're, you haven't gone through a lot of uh, new challenges of late, right? I mean, you've been at the same place for almost two decades. Now you're getting set to take over as, uh, you know, your first college head job in a year that has been like no other in college sports, sports in general, the world, right? So Presbyterian just finishes up uh, playing a spring season under a different coaching staff. You're coming in with a whole different philosophy of how to approach the game of football. You don't know a lot of your players yet. You certainly haven't gone through a camp with them yet. So my question is, knowing all that is going into this fall, how much do you still need to figure out before you actually know this is the game plan we're going to go put forth in 2021? Are you planning on easing on the gas a little bit as far as implementing a whole new playbook, uh, knowing that your players uh, are still trying to juggle everything that's gone on in the last six to 18 months? You know, I don't think you can pull back. Uh, and, and, you know, people have different – I've talked to some of my really good friends in the college game, some that have changed a lot of jobs. And I, I think you just got to be you. And I've never been a guy that's held back on anything, you know, on the field or off. So I don't know that, I, that that's the time to start doing it now when I've got a new job. I feel like, you know, whether people believe it or not, getting hired at Presbyterian College is pretty dang awesome. I mean, you're a high school guy now. You're a Division One FCS. And you need to go with what got you there. And if that style got me there, that personality got me there, then I think I should continue with that. And so it is, you know, the hard part is what you said. They played in the spring, so I didn't get spring ball with them. Um, so I did. So my install, because they're non-scholarship, I won't even have everybody back until August the 5th. So, I mean, they're not going to summer school here and doing all that. I've literally got to start at like a high school and in, install on August the 5th. So I've got a month to get them ready. But during that time, through some of the things NCAA is allowing with meetings and this, we're trying to send out information, get them to study it. So at least they're familiar with terminology. But we're going to throw it all in there. And when we get on the field, we're going to play the brand. And we all, the one thing I can tell you is we're going to make the decision I think is best for, to help us win that game and then put them together one game at a time and, and uh, see what happens at the end. I'm curious about the cutoff points for this philosophy. You've won a lot, and you've won by a lot a lot of different times. How off, what's the cutoff point for going for it on fourth down? What's the cutoff point for going for it? You know, if you're up, you know, 35 nothing mid third, are you going for onside kicks at that point? Are you going? I for sure hope points? we're up at some point on somebody 35 to nothing at mid third. I think that would make Jeff, I'm your our defensive coordinator, happy in the team, and I think us too. But, but you know, yeah, the cutoff point. It's been onside kicks, depending on what quarter it is and stuff like that. You know, after halftime. Uh, you know, if we've been up 28 or 35, yeah, we're pulling the gas way back. In the first quarter, it's kind of anything goes. Second quarter, you know, we'll try to kick it deeper on onside kicks if we're up 21 or 28, you know, depending on how the game's going. So, yeah, there's definite times, and I hope we're in the situation to have to make that decision. I'm, I'm ready to make the hard decisions, but th that would be an easier one to make for sure. Now, everyone focuses on that, but you're, you're pretty innovative on the offensive end just in general. It just looks like a lot of speed and space. That's the key? I mean, how would you describe it? I think the one thing that I'm really good at, and like I say, I'm not good at much more. I mean, like my wife changes the light bulbs in the house and all that <laughs> kind of stuff. But but I think the one thing I'm good at is designing offenses that get kids in space. And and now it's a space game and, and different things like that. And, and so I want to I wanna create an offense, and I don't mind pitching the ball around. We don't mind running trick plays. We don't mind anything that shows that over a period of time those have been good uh, explosive type plays. You know, we'll do them. And some people call them risky because the ball's floating around a little bit and can be – you know, fumbled or whatever, and everybody's worried about turnovers. That's where that risk aversion thing is. They're thinking about the bad. I'm thinking about the good. So it's going to be a different kind of football, but it's it's hopefully an offensive brand that people haven't seen very much. But if they could appreciate it, it'll be exciting. In the end, you know, if you're, if you're scoring some points, at least it draws the attention of fans and wants to put them in the seats. Um, and so hopefully there will be some of that too. Do you have a punter on the roster? Will you? <laughs> we – we, I, I don't know. That's or a good question. Or will you have a guy that can punt? We'll have a guy. Well, I usually make the quarterback punt. If we've got a punter on the roster that can punt well, we'll use them. And if we don't, 
then we won't. And uh, But if we don't, then I'll make the quarterback punt as kind of a punishment for putting us in that situation in the first place. <laughs> Although it's ultimately my fault. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, lay some of the, the fun punt blame on him. Your kickoff guy, what's the practice rep split between onside kick, squib kick, and traditional kicking off? Uh, depending on what they need more of. I think they're good at kicking off already, so they'll need a little more work on the onside and the, and the squib type kicks. You know, you, you, you got a lot of swagger to you, which is uh, pr pretty, I mean, I guess it's warranted given the resume that you come in with, but your first introductory press conference, you come in here and you say, year one, I want to win the Pioneer League and get to the FCS playoffs. Year two, I want to be competing for a national championship. Uh, the level of confidence it takes to go into your first college head job uh, is pretty high at that point. Where, where does that stem from? I just, I, 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 I've read too many books that are non-football, and I believe that there's a way to get everything done. I just believe there's a, there's a different way to be successful. It's out there, it's how much you're willing to risk. Well, obviously I'm willing to risk looking silly on the field, non-traditional and things like that. And I, and I just believe that. And I, and I think if you set goals, you, you, you come, people as a group, when you've got a team and a good leadership, they'll accomplish most goals or get close to those. So if we set those to win six games, we're gonna win five or six games. If we set those to win the conference, we're gonna win the conference or get within one of that possibly. I think you can't accomplish them if you don't reach for them. And I mean, don't just reach for them, but you make that, that's our mission, that's our goal. I don't have a bunch of other goals. We wanna convert you know, 40% on fourth down or something like that, or we wanna hold the other team under 10 points. It doesn't matter how you do it. Our goal is to win that game, but our goal for the, our goal for the season is to, uh, win the conference this year and get to the playoffs. We want to make it to the playoffs. And I don't think that it's if, – if, if I say anything less than that, with my beliefs, and I don't think every coach should have to say that, but with my beliefs and the way I believe, then I think I'm not doing the school and the, and the football team a service for all the time and effort and commitment they're making if that's not our goal, if that's not our beliefs or extreme success. How do you break it down to the kids? So, you know, you, you get a whole locker, full, locker room full of guys on a practice day one of fall camp. What do you say to them as you start to install this philosophy? Hey, hey guys, forget about everything you've ever been taught about football. This is how we're going to do things. Or, you know, keep those fundamentals in check, but here's how we're going to add to it. That's a good point. I've already had to tell our coaches twice in staff meetings. I had to do it today, for, as a matter of fact. Forget everything you know about football for a minute and pretend you didn't know anything. Would this way make sense to you now? And I say that to you about punting. If you knew nothing, if we brought – I always tell when I'm trying to win somebody over or get them to buy in. If we brought aliens in from outer space and they read the rules of football and they saw that well, you're using those downs to march it down and try to score, but it, on one of the downs you're using it to give it to the other team, so you are in fact trying not to score there and giving them the ball, aliens would think you're crazy. People that didn't know the rules would think you're crazy. So I ask them sometimes to think differently, completely take everything you've been brainwashed out of and, and or in and throw that out so you can kind of understand or at least begin to accept a different way to play the game. Because when all you've ever seen is one way to do something, like we see that cars have four tires on, you know, four, four wheels. If somebody had a, brought a car and it had seven wheels and it was a Toyota Camry, we would think that's crazy. I don't know if I want to buy one of those because that's all we know is a four-wheel car. All everybody knows is the kind of football they've seen for years and years and years. And I, I just hope our fans give this a chance. I just hope our fans give this a chance. I hope the media gives it a chance. And look, if it doesn't work, I'm the guy, condemn me, it's all my fault. If it does work, it's because some people bought in, gave it a chance, and the players worked really hard to accomplish a goal together and became a team that uh, in a very short period of time. Final one for me, I know you gotta get going and I, I certainly do appreciate you uh, making some time for us here, but you know, you only know so much of your roster. You haven't seen them uh, 11 on 11 quite yet. You're, you know, you got a lot of things you need to sort out, as you mentioned, and you won't be able to really do it until early August. So knowing that there's that much in the unknown category, what can you guarantee that football fans here in the upstate will see out of Presbyterian football this year? What I guarantee they're going to see, first of all, it's like high school because I, I didn't get to go recruit these guys. I've got what I was given. 
And that's how we learn to play the game. Some of my better friends that are coaching in college now have said high school coaches are the best ones because you coached around your talent. You don't get to go get your talent and plug guys into spots you want them to. So I'm excited about that. But what people are going to see different probably if they're watching Presbyterian football is they're going to see onside kicks. They're going to see a team use all four downs the vast majority of the time. I think they're going to see a very different style of offense than they've seen not just here but anywhere else. And uh, I, I think, if, if nothing else, they can walk away from the game going, they saw the game played a little differently. Not different to be different, but different to give us the best chance for success. And that's what I want them to see. Coach, I appreciate the time. Good luck to you. Uh, it's head coach of Presbyterian football, Kevin Kelly, one of the uh, most popular coaches on the national high school circuit, now getting set to make his college debut right here in the upstate of South Carolina. Uh, it certainly should be fun to see how this whole thing progresses, but there's one thing that I can guarantee is that if his style is anything like what we've seen in the past, it'll be must-watch TV without question. Coach, I appreciate the time. Thank you for joining us here for In-Depth with Fox Carolina Sports. Another great episode coming for you next week. Have a great one, everybody.